Funding for this program is provided by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King seafood seasoning mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Hello, I'm Chef John Foles, welcoming you to this great state of ours. We're real proud of our people, places, and food, and I'd like for you to know a little bit more about it. So join me and some of my friends as we visit the historical food towns of this state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Everybody and welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, and I'm so excited about today's show because we are still looking for those great historical food towns of Louisiana, and we've found two of them in the northeast corner of our state in East Carroll Parish. Today we're going to visit the towns of Lake Providence, and you're not going to believe this, Transylvania, Louisiana. That's right, Transylvania. Lake Providence is one of those great, great lakes in our state. It's fresh water, about seven miles long and about one mile wide. A lot of camps and private residences right here on gorgeous Lake Providence in East Carroll Parish. There's a lot of overnight accommodation, so if you want to visit, hey, there's a lot of places to stay. This is Grant's Canal, a lot of history here. Ulysses S. Grant actually dug this canal to try to circumvent Vicksburg during the Civil War, and they dug this Union forces with their own hands. Of course, the project failed. This is the Arlington House, 1834 it was built, and Grant used this as his command post while digging Grant's Canal. The Barley House is a community and visitor center from around 1900, and it's a community project to actually build this house where people could stop by and visit when coming to the town. The Old Dutch Bakery is one of the rare finds, not only in Louisiana, but all over the world. This little bitty bakery is owned by Kathy and Marlon Weedle, and they're a Mennonite family, and I just happened to walk into that bakery one day, and hey, take a look at this. There's poppy seed bread, there's raisin bread, sourdough. I tell you, the fruit cakes and the pound cakes are the most, un yeah, I know, I look like a pig here, but so what, I love all of this stuff. And she was such a nice lady. They serve lunches here about five days a week, and they have some of these great Mennonite lunching specials right out of this cookbook that you can actually sit down right here in the bakery and have a really nice lunch any day. This is about 150, I guess, Mennonites came to this area about 15 or 20 years ago and not only got involved in farming and fishing, but I obviously, as you can see, opened a wonderful bakery. I took a fruitcake home this day, and I'm going to tell you, it was without a doubt the most magnificent fruitcake I had ever seen. And one of the dishes that I'm going to do today is right out of that great Mennonite cookbook, and it's the seven bean soup. And I tell you, when you see this recipe, you're going to love it. So this is Kathy right here, not Kathy Weedle, but another Kathy who actually works in the bakery. And what a great personality she had. And I'm sure she was one of the wonderful bakers here. For lunch that day, I had a nice baked chicken dish. And even though it didn't have oysters like the dish I'm going to cook today, it had a little bit shrimp on top of it, I'm sure right from Lake Providence. Hey, Transylvania. Can you believe a town in Louisiana called Transylvania? I love this sign. Right on the general store. The general store is owned by Norman Chapel. And look at here, we always need new blood in town. Imagine going into the general store in Transylvania and seeing this sign. Baby Vampire Bats. I had to open it very cautiously to see these little bitty bats because they were chirping away right inside of the box. And I reached in and got one. Take a look at this. Can you imagine? I'll tell you one thing. That's a baby vampire bat. Yeah, give me a break, you know? Hey, you can fool a Cajun once, but you'll never fool a Cajun twice, I guarantee you that. I still have my little Transylvania badge on right here. And I tell you, the people up there around Lake Providence 
and Transylvania, just so fantastic. I love that area. And if you get a chance to visit East Carroll Parish in either one of those two towns, you're going to make a lot of new friends. I mentioned that there's a lot of good food in that area, but there's also a lot of great art. My guest today is from Transylvania, and Betty Sullivan not only knows a lot about the town and how it got its name and all of that, we're going to talk to her about that, She's one of the great artists of Louisiana, and she's going to share with us some of her stories about living in that town, and we're going to take a look at some of the beautiful art that uh, Betty Sullivan produces there. So she'll be here to visit with us in just a little while. Well, let's talk about cooking Transylvania style. I'm doing today the first dish is going to be a casserole of baked chicken. It's going to be actually twice cooked because I'm going to pan fry it first or saute it, not too much oil and then I'm going to make a nice casserole out of it. I'm going to kick up my fire in my old fry pan here, and I'm going to begin this casserole, as you can see right here on my cutting board, with a few pieces of nice chicken. Of course, you can buy chicken already cut up. I always tell people to buy the whole chicken, cut it yourself, debone it, make some good chicken stock, keep it in the freezer. It's wonderful. And then, of course, look at these oysters. Oysters are all over Louisiana, and make sure that you know where your oysters are coming from. There's been a lot of oyster and seafood scares around the United States, but hey, just be careful. Know where your product is coming from, and that's the main thing. You'll always get good. Don't stay away from oysters just because you think they're not good to eat. What I'm going to do is take a little flour here, and I'm going to season the batter, the, the flour, with a little bit salt. I'm going to sprinkle a little salt, a little cracked black pepper, a little thyme and basil. Of course, you can use fresh or dried, either one. And of course, you can put a little cayenne pepper if you want a little bit more spice. And I'm going to take a piece of the chicken and dust it. Of course, you notice I'm not adding any batter here, no milk and no eggs. I don't want it that thick because this casserole is going to be covered with a white sauce. Now I'm going to put it right into my black iron skillet with a little oil. I'm using vegetable oil here. And of course, uh, you can use a low cholesterol oil. You can use a buttery flavored oil, whatever you would like. And I want my chicken to get nice and crispy on the outside, but about medium rare on the inside because I'm going to bake it. Now, I'm going to make my white sauce. Let me get this out of the way. Into my little black iron skillet here, I'm going to put a little bit of my buttery flavored oil, which I love to use out of my old Model A bottle. And then I'm going to make my white sauce by starting with the great flavors of Louisiana cooking. A little bit onions, celery, or you know what I like to put in a pot. You've seen me enough. Onions, celery, some of the pretty colored bell peppers. I always like the red and golden bell peppers. And then, of course, garlic. I like to have garlic into my white sauce. Gives it that good Louisiana flavor. And then I'll saute all of these nice vegetable flavorings around into the pot so that the buttery flavored oil will pick up all of those great flavors. Now, I'm going to add into that the basis for the white sauce, which is, of course, a little bit flour. Sprinkle in just a touch of flour. And of course, remember the formula for a roux. About one cup of flour and about a cup of oil or butter will thicken about three quarts of liquid. So you know, if you want a real heavy uh, sauce, you want to add a lot more flour, a light sauce a lot less. Now, I'm going to flavor it with some of the main ingredients here. I'm going to put oyster liquor into it. Now, this is the liquid that comes right out of the oyster shell. When the seafood guy kind of cracks that shell and pours it out, all the great flavor of oysters. I'm going to put that right down into the white sauce. Let me lower my black iron pot over here so I can make sure I don't scorch my chicken. I'll stir this around. And you can see, you can imagine how that oyster flavor is going to be put right into this white sauce. Look how nice and creamy that is. And then I'll add a little bit chicken stock, because you're never going to find enough of the oyster liquor. So don't think you're going to find that much. Just put enough chicken stock or beef stock or just water if uh, you don't have any of the rest. But of course, you can get the little bouillon cubes in the store. And now I'm going to make the white sauce by finishing it by putting a little heavy whipping cream. Of course, you can use yogurt. You could use skim milk, any of those nice light creams. I'll put a little of that in there. And then let this come to a little rolling boil here. And of course, the flour will thicken it. But look how nice and smooth this sauce is. And now I'll add a couple of my oysters. Let me get a couple of these oysters off of my little plate. And I'll put them right down into the sauce like this. And again, you don't want to overcook 
those oysters. So you want to put them right down in there and season this sauce with a little bit, again, salt and pepper. Remember the chicken is already seasoned, so you don't want to over season your sauce. Just bring those oysters to a little simmer. And then of course, you'll want to add a little touch of that good Louisiana hot sauce to spice it up and pour it right over the chicken in the skillet. And I'm going to go ahead and take this and pour it right over the fried chicken. Of course, if you'd like, you could also remove, whoo, boy, talk about hot, huh? Get this fire out of the way here. Talk about hot. That is a sizzle. Put all oysters in there and then garnish it with a little bit parsley. Well, I've always said those black iron pots are the best cooking pots in the world, and now you know why. Look how hot that is. Now, I'll tell you what else I would put right on top of the pot. A little bit grated cheese. You can use American cheese, Parmesan, anything. I'm gonna put a little bit of this nice provolone cheese right on top of it, put a cover on it, and this is gonna go into about a 350 degree oven. Remember, the chicken is almost cooked. You don't wanna overcook it. But I've got one already done, so I'm going to move it out so I can show it to you to get it out of the oven. And of course, the great thing about this dish is that once you take it out of the oven, it's already in its own casserole dish. Look at that. All you have to do is garnish it just a little more with a little of that color, and then you put it right onto the table in the casserole dish, just like this, in the black iron skillet, and it gives a really nice country look to the dish. But what flavor with the oysters, the oyster liquor, the white sauce, and of course, the fried chicken. So it's almost like a twice cooked chicken. So I'll move that right out of the way, and of course, substitute shrimp or clams, mussels, whatever you have in your own area, or leave the seafood out, just bacon and a nice white sauce. It would be just great. Okay, what's the next dish I'd like to do for you from Transylvania. I mentioned the seven bean soup, and I want you to take a look at this bowl. You know, one of my greatest memories of growing up in Louisiana was eating seven bean soup. You see, we have the white limers, the little uh, green split peas, the red beans, the white beans, black, black eyed peas, and of course, there's the little pink pinto beans. And I remember my grandmother used to make this soup all the time, and when I found it up in Transylvania, I was shocked because it brought back great memories, and we always cooked it with a little bit stew meat or pork beef, whatever, or smoked sausage. Of course, I remember she used to do it with both of the meats, and that's what I want to do for you today. I'm going to show you just how simple it is to make this seven bean soup. I have to fire up this pot again, and of course, I'm going to add just a little bit of the buttery flavored oil. Again, you can use any oil you'd like. Even a little olive oil is great in the seven bean soup. And as I said, she would always use meat or sausage, but a lot of times living on the Mississippi River, she would use river shrimp or any kind of seafood into the pot. But use, uh, uh, use this or just eliminate the meat altogether. The seven beans would be great just by themselves. I'm going to start off by sauteing the meat, and I'll put both of them in here, the sausage for the, uh, for the smoke flavor. And of course, the stew meat, I'll put all of this in there. And this will give great body and texture to the soup. And of course, it's a one pot meal. So I'm gonna simmer that in my black iron pot for just a second once it gets nice and hot. And then I have to flavor it again with the flavors of Louisiana. We have to put in a little onions. And again, use whatever flavors you would like, but I'm gonna put onions, celery, some red and yellow bell pepper because I want the color in the soup because even though the seven beans have a lot of color, I want to make sure that the vegetables have a lot of color as well. So I'll stir all of this around into the pot. And of course, you just want to go ahead and uh, seal the flavorings into the meat. You don't want to sit here and cook this meat forever. You just want to kind of white it out to seal in the juices because that's where the great stock will get flavored with the smoked sausage and the meat. If you put seafood in it, the same thing would happen. You'd get that great seafood flavor. Now. I've got all of the seven beans in my nice little bowl here all layered. And you know, you can even buy a seven bean soup package in the store that all the, meat, all the beans are already layered for you. So you might just look for the bag of the seven beans or whatever right in the store. I'm going to pour that right into my pot. The important thing here, of course, is that you want to 
simmer the uh, beans with the meat because you want to coat the beans well. They'll start to pick up that flavor right away. And then we'll add the fresh chicken stock, and that's what the beans are going to cook in. Chicken stock. I'll put about oh, a quart or so of chicken stock right down into my pot. And then I would let this come to a rolling boil. I'm going to flavor it with a little salt, pepper, of course, salt and pepper, a little thyme and basil. And then I'm going to put some fresh mint into the pot. Fresh mint will give the seven bean soup just a great, great flavor. I'm going to put the whole mint leaves right down into the pot. Allow this to boil for about an hour to an hour and a half because it's going to take that long for the beans to get nice and tender. But while the beans are cooking, always mash the beans against the side of the pot once they start to get tender because that way the soup will end up with a nice creamy look to it. And again, I have some already done and I want to show you what it looks like when we have an opportunity to plate it up. Let me get that fire off. I've got a big pretty bowl here. I want you to take a look at this nice big old bowl of soup. And I'm going to put the seven beans with the sausage and look at that. Whew, talk about a hearty pot of soup. And the meat and the sausages give the soup a nice flavor. And I remember my grandmother used to tell me to always put in a nice little ear of corn because it was a great garnish on the top of the bowl. And then again, I would certainly add some colors to it. I'd add a little yellow, naturally, and a little green to finish it. And that's what the soup would look like when it's done. Seven bean soup. What a wonderful presentation. And I was reminded of that great dish when I visited uh, Lake Providence in Transylvania. What would I serve with that soup? Well, at the Mennonite Bakery, I learned about this nice pumpkin bread. And the pumpkin bread goes really great with the soup. So I baked it off, put a little powdered sugar on top of it. It's wonderful, really nice pumpkin bread. And then soup, nothing is lighter than a great spring or summer salad. And use uh, red or yellow tomatoes. What I've done is taken the tomatoes and marinated them in a little bit of Italian dressing with fresh thyme, basil, and cracked black pepper. I marinated them overnight, and this is going to be a wonderful accompaniment to that great big bowl of soup or the chicken casserole, either one of them. Okay, now I promised you that we were going to meet a great friend of mine from Transylvania, Betty Sullivan, an artist, and she is coming in right now. Hey, come on in, Betty. How you doing? Hi, John. Man, look at this great, Rock great painting. <laughs> what do you have here? I have some speckle belly geese in the rice field in East Carroll Parish. Oh, boy, is this a scene that I'm familiar with, speckle belly geese. You know, this is my, one of my favorite geese to cook as well, but this is a big rice field. Yeah. Right out of East Carroll, huh? That's right. When you uh, were in looking at my paintings and you enjoyed these, this wildlife, and so I brought this to you. And I appreciate it. I've got a great place for this. I've always wanted to own a Sullivan. Now I own one. Let me, look, I'm going to put it right here on the easel. Right. And I'll tell you, I thank you so much for bringing this. What a beautiful, beautiful painting. When I was in your gallery and looking at all the wildlife, you're a fabulous wildlife uh, artist. Thank and I, I want to commend you on that. Just beautiful paintings. Uh, you know, I want to ask you, it, it amazes me how people can one day determine that they're going to be an artist, that uh, they wake up and he, here they are. They've got this great talent. How, how do you know when you're going to become an artist? How do you know if you're an artist? Well, I remember back in the third grade, I loved to draw. And during those times in school, a friend of mine and I were asked to decorate the different uh, chalkboards in the classrooms. And we did at holidays, which we love getting out of class. <laughs> And then through the years, I studied on my own a while and uh, finally was able to take about eight years of art instruction. And uh, just, you know, there's something within you as an artist that you see things that inspire you and you love to paint and you just, um, there's a story in what you see. Like when I see an old house just about to tumble down, and I begin to think about maybe a family that lived there through the years and what they did for a living. And whether I ever paint it or not, it's in my mind. <laughs> uh, when I yeah. see the old Louisiana blue heron in a bar pit, and I have painted one right, of them. Right. And so it's just something within a person that you want to put on canvas, not only for yourself, for others to see. For others to see as well. You know, 
uh, we were lucky enough to take some shots of some of the wonderful, wonderful art that you do. And we want to take a look at it. I want to share it with some of our viewers. And I want you to tell us basically what we're looking at as we see those great, great uh, paintings. What do we have All here? Right. This is Papa's Camp at the, at the east end of Lake Providence. Grant's Canal begins right there. And it is on uh, stilts because during the rainy season, the lake does rise. Right. Oh, look at this. Isn't this a great painting? Okay, this is a, a coon hunter. Uh, coon hunting is a well-loved sport in, around Transylvania. And uh, the dogs you see there are all show dogs. They're uh, very expensive dogs. And uh, the men love their dogs. And they say that as they hunt, they can as they hear the voices, they know which dog belongs to them. Is, is that right? They know them that. Boy, have I seen this scene up in not only East Carroll Parish, but around Lake Bruin, where I have a lake home. Look at this beautiful pair of deer. Yes, there's some beautiful woodlands along the Mississippi, and this is a pair of deer. Uh, this deer with the beautiful antlers is probably a hunter's dream, what they might call the rocking chair. Right. <laughs> And then this is some mallard ducks on a, a cottonwood bar, which is an island in the Mississippi River near Transylvania. Oh, this is just beautiful. And oh, here's another. Is that coon hunters as well? Well, this is a different kind of coon hunting. This is the old coon hunter, maybe like my dad hunted with his old gum boots and flannel shirt and his, just his old beloved dogs that he had around. So, so you don't have to have show dogs. Uh, uh, if, if you have your right. favorite old coon dog, you can show them exactly how to get them, huh? That's right. What beautiful scenes. They really are gorgeous. And, you know, you you really capture that the scenes of North Louisiana in a way that very few people can do it, and I commend you for that. Uh, does the creative juices of an artist get to flowing a little bit faster when they live out in the rural areas of, uh, of the United States as you do in this wonderful little bitty sleepy small lake town? Uh, do you get up in the morning inspired to uh, uh, to create because of those surroundings? I do. There's so many pretty things there, and the grass is lush. There's so many flowers and beautiful crops where we live, and uh, the bodies of water. And there's so many things I'd like to paint that I I will never get to paint, but they're just the gorgeous areas, and there are a lot of artists around our area. I teach children art classes ages six to fourteen. And then I teach a ladies art class. Is there any? I, I know you do a lot of uh, a, a lot of landscape uh, uh, with wildlife, and I know you do the the scenes of the hunters. Is that what you really like to do, or do you ever get back and do things that you personally love to do that you want to call your own, or is this uh, similar to everything you do? Some of the things I like to do on my own. Many things are what people ask me to do, what they love, and want me to put put on canvas for them. I want to talk a little bit about Transylvania. I want to cook something, too, because you gave me this great recipe for baked apples, and I want to share that. Then I want to talk about Transylvania, okay. because I have here three great apples. I've got the red and two wonderful green apples, and you told me to core them out and put a little orange juice in them just like this, and this makes a wonderful light, light recipe. I'm going to put some grated orange peel. Is that that's what goes right. in it, right? Okay. Orange peel, just like that and the orange zest right around the apples. And I, I tell you, this dish was so simple, but yet when I tasted it, it was one of the most unbelievable flavors. I'm going to put a little touch of ginger. Okay. Uh, very, very nice, light uh, dish after one of those big speckle belly geese dinners that, <laughs> that we had a couple times. A little bit cinnamon. I love too. cinnamon. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really is. It mm -hmm. comes out really nice. And what's more appropriate with Transylvania or Halloween than apples? Right. Now, I would put a little raisins and sugar right onto the apples mm -hmm. like this, and then raisins into the center. And, of course, I guess you can stuff this with any type of fruit, but I'm going to put a little dried raisins right into it, and then drizzle honey. Yeah, it mm -hmm. really is nice mm -hmm. and healthy for it. And then Best drizzle honey, honey uh, mm -hmm. just like that. Right. And then this would bake in about a 350-degree oven for about a half hour or so, and I know good and well we have a big platter of them right oh, here, and I want beautiful. to show these. So I tell you, I really appreciate you giving me this dish. Now, let's a little bit about Transylvania, the town of Transylvania. How does a town like that get its name? I couldn't believe it when I discovered it. Well, there are a couple of stories about how the Transylvania may have gotten the name. There was a Transylvania company, land company, that had land in Kentucky, 
and one of the stores is they bought the land, and uh, Transylvania means across the woods. Right, right across and, the woods. I remember that. Okay, and then there's another story that one of the men with the company, who was a graduate of Transylvania University in Kentucky, wanted to name it after his alma mater, and and he did. So I don't know. You take your pick. <laughs> Somebody was telling me that people search out the town of Transylvania, Louisiana, from all over the world just to take a picture of the sign there. Is that true? They do. They love to have their picture taken by the sign. Sometimes they take the sign. <laughs> And I have a little antique shop there, art and antique shop, and I have people from really all over the world coming in from Germany, uh, France, Canada, uh, Peru, you just name it. Uh, one of the things that Transylvania is really famous for is the teddy bear. Most people don't know that the teddy bear originated right, right. there in Transylvania and Lake Providence. Uh, I, quickly, how did that story yes. uh, happen? Uh, our president, Theodore Roosevelt, in about 1907, came uh, with his group to bear hunt uh, the black bear. And the story is that a cartoonist in New York got the story. And so he uh, drew a cartoon of uh, uh, a bear dressed as Teddy Roosevelt with his Canadian Mountie hat right. and the suspenders. And, and the story was that the president was there killing the poor little bear. <laughs> and uh, then the teddy bear was named. Right after Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, there's no more popular little animal today than the teddy bear. <laughs> all all and, originating right, right there in uh, uh, Lake Providence. Well, I know there's a lot of similarities between food and art because every time I look at a plate, that becomes my canvas. And I thank you so much for sharing all those great stories with us and sharing this great apple recipe. And I tell you what, I'm going to come back to visit you in Transylvania. And I want you all to come back and visit me right here as we continue to cook up more of these great Taste of Louisiana. We'll see y'all later. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. This is PBS. The Companion Cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $22.95. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Fultz features recipes and food history behind Louisiana's cuisine. This 352-page cookbook contains over 250 recipes, including those from this show. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.